It is good to be with you this morning. We are in the garage again today, back in front of the wood pile. I have been living out here since I got back from Washington State nearly two weeks ago at first to keep my wife safe from me and now to keep me safe from her. That is the way things have gone at our house over the past few weeks. Dane County is a real hot spot right now, as most of you know. Uh, unfortunately, several of our own members have tested positive for COVID-19 over the past week or two. Uh, others are awaiting test results. I think around 14 of us uh, either positive or waiting for test results right now. And so uh, the elders have decided to go back to an online service for at least the time being for a couple weeks. And then we'll reevaluate that and decide where to go from there. But I will miss seeing you on the front lawn at church today, and I, I hope all of you are doing well. As we did back in late March and into April and then into May, we'd like to encourage all of you to partake of the Lord's Supper at home this morning. We have some recipes for the unleavened bread out there on our website and also on the church's Facebook page. Uh, most grocery stores also have unleavened bread, the matzo crackers in the ethnic food section among the Jewish foods. And we've also determined to the best of our ability that Triscuits seem to qualify as unleavened bread. Uh, just make sure the only ingredients are wheat, oil, and salt, and there is no leavening in most Triscuits, at least the ones that I've looked at. So just be aware of that as a possibility. But we do have some options there. We can get grape juice, obviously, just about anywhere, including most gas stations. And I'm so thankful for that, that worship is incredibly simple and yet profound, isn't it? very easy to do in terms of the supplies that we need. The supplies are minimal. We would also encourage you to sing together, obviously, at some point together uh, today with your family or alone if you need to. Uh, remember, James talks about if anyone's happy, let him sing praises. And so that's certainly something we can do alone or with a small group. And then please also remember we have a link for electronic giving on our website and also uh, in the bulletin. And as always, checks can be mailed to the church's post office box, which is also uh, in the bulletin. I'm here in this format to bring a lesson from the Word of God. And so I hope that we are able to do that today. And as we get started, I do want to be clear about God's plan of salvation. We know that God sent His Son to die in our place as a sacrifice for our sins. And we respond to that sacrifice by believing the message, by turning away from sin, by confessing our belief in Jesus as the Son of God, and by allowing ourselves to be buried with Jesus in baptism for the forgiveness of our sins. And we're sharing one example this morning from the Roser Road congregation down in Phoenix, Arizona. Tony Fierro was baptized into the Lord Jesus this past Sunday morning, one week ago, and so we rejoice with Tony this morning and with his new Christian family out in Arizona. And again, we are sharing this by way of encouragement. What Tony did a week ago, you can do today. Get in touch with one of the elders, and we would be honored to help in whatever way that we can. So please give us a call. This morning, we'll be looking at another request that came in from someone who's been joining us on the phone every week. If you're joining us on the phone and have something that we need to study in sermon form, a question, a favorite passage, a topic that we need to explore, I would love to hear from you. Uh, give me a call or send a text if you can to 608-224-0274. Maybe a month or so ago, one of our good senior saints called me with something of a crisis of conscience. That's, I think, the way that I would describe that. Uh, I have some notes from that call where I quickly scribble down what she said, and so I will do the best I can to relay what she said in the most accurate way possible. I hope that she will forgive me. Uh, ahead of time if I fail to communicate this as clearly as I could, but as I remember it and as my notes indicated, she had just been to Walmart and she'd been in the cookie aisle and right there in the cookie aisle, her Christian faith suddenly became incredibly relevant and she had to make a decision. Now, by way of background, she claims that the Chesapeake cookies by Pepperidge Farm are perhaps the world's most perfect cookie. Now, that right there is a serious claim, isn't it? There's a lot on the line with that claim. Remember, we're also in the middle of a pandemic. Well, she approaches the appropriate shelf as she is looking for these cookies, and there are just a few left. But this in itself is pretty amazing because apparently there is something of a Chesapeake cookie shortage in the world right now. 
uh, similar to the toilet paper shortage we had a few months ago. So it's that and the cookies. Things are short. And word on the street is, get these while you can, because the shelves are often empty. Well, she goes in there, she sees a few left. But as she's standing there, a scripture comes to mind. And she remembers the words of Jesus. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. And so in a moment of Christian maturity and courage, she applies the words of Jesus to the situation. She realizes that if she were the next person to walk down that aisle, she would want somebody to leave some Pepperidge Farm Chesapeake's for her. And so she decides to take one or two and to leave the rest and not to empty that shelf. And she then gets home and she calls me and she asks that we study together Luke chapter 6 verse 31. And I'm totally amazed. First of all, that there is apparently a hoarding problem with a cookie that I've never heard of. How in the world has that been allowed to happen? How do I not know this? But secondly, I'm also amazed at the self-control. And that right there is also amazing to me. And so when I hear this, I decide that I need to go do some research. I need to go out and find me some Pepperidge Farm Chesapeake cookies. <laughs> and I don't have time to look at Luke. <laughs> I need to go get myself to a Walmart before these things disappear completely. And, and I'm also looking for some Comet shower cleaner. That's also been uh, running up short in this uh, in this pandemic. And, and by the time I strike out here and there, I'm starting to get concerned. You know, they don't have them here. They don't have them there. And I'm thinking, what she said is absolutely true. There's There's empty shelves on these things everywhere I go. And I get to the Walmart in Sun Prairie, and I hit the mother load on both. But again, this is research. I'm doing this for the sake of learning. I need to understand where she's coming from. And I'll tell you, these are some amazing cookies. Chesapeake dark chocolate pecan. Pepperidge Farm baked with big chocolate chunks, they say right there on the front. That is absolutely true i can testify from experience on the side here it says baked with care and rich dark chocolate crunchy pecans creamery butter cage-free eggs and real vanilla extract and, it, and it's looking so good and so I, I dig in by way of research of course and I did notice as I did my research that they have apparently made a huge, huge mistake in the nutrition facts section. Uh, these people seem to suggest that a serving size is one cookie. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Serving size of one cookie. That, that is clearly not my experience. That is not what happened with this bag of cookies. Uh, they say they have eight servings in this bag. That is not the case at all. I would say this bag is more like two servings. They're, they're actually divided in half very neatly in this bag. And so it, it divides the bag into one and two servings. So I would say instead of eight servings, there are clearly uh, two servings in that bag. But other than that, I have been very impressed. Uh, on my recent trip out west, two of these servings kept me awake through most of Montana, as I remember it. Uh, but very, very good. Nevertheless, when I got home, I continued the research. Uh, this time looking at the passage she recommended, Luke 6, verse 31. And I realized that in 30 years of preaching, I have never preached a sermon from Luke chapter 6. And again, how did that happen? I've preached on the golden rule from Matthew chapter 7, but never from the account in Luke chapter 6. And so I want to change that today. All of us will probably agree that we're living in a world that's pretty uptight right now. Is that accurate? I think that's something we can say very safely. The world is tense. I mean, all around us, we got people worried about getting sick, about having food, about having an income. We got political stuff going on right now, just a couple days away from this big election. And people are on edge. Some of us are on edge. And, and all of us, I think, we need this reminder. We need this passage that we're about to look at. And so if you have a Bible, I would invite you to be turning with me to Luke chapter 6. 
And as we make our way to Luke 6, I want to warn all of us by way of reminder. If we're looking for a nice, easy kind of faith, where we show up or log in or tune in on the phone to worship once a week and then we're done with it for the next seven days, if that's what we're looking for, true Christianity is not what we're looking for. However, if we're looking for the kind of faith that reaches out and and grabs you and disturbs you in the cookie aisle at Walmart, stay tuned. Following Jesus is a blessing, but it is also a very real challenge sometimes. What we sometimes refer to as the golden rule is found in Luke 6.31, and that's where Jesus says, treat others the same way you want them to treat you. That right there is hard enough, isn't it? If this is the only Bible that we had, this one verse, this right here would do it. This right here would keep us out of trouble for a lifetime. If we could live up to this verse, we'd be doing well. I had a hard time organizing my thoughts on all of this this week. I decided that we needed to widen it up a little bit, and I want us to notice the surrounding verses, not just verse 31, but several verses before and after it. And What I noticed as I read this whole paragraph that this verse is in the middle of, what I noticed was the surrounding verses are jam-packed full of action words. But as I read, I kept noticing some repetition in this paragraph. There There were little sets of action words that were pretty much repeated, not perfectly parallel, but several of them were repeated several times in this paragraph. And so for the purpose of our study this morning, as we look at the golden rule, I actually want us to look at Luke 6, 27 through 36, and I want us to notice some action words. That'll be our first way of looking at this. We'll we'll notice the action words. Then we'll look at two practical examples Jesus gives here. And then we'll end with our motivation for doing these things. Treating others the same way we want to be treated, uh, that's the heart of it. But Jesus gives some examples, and every single one of these is a challenge. So as we study this request from one of our senior saints, let's look together at Luke 6, verses 27 through 31. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 31, the words of our Lord. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. So again, let's start by noticing some actions in this passage. And as we go through these, I'll try to compare and contrast God's standard as opposed to the world's standard. That's part of the the parallel that's going on here. So let's start with Jesus commanding us to love our enemy. So this is action number one. Love is an action word. We see this in verse 27. We also see it down in verse 35. Then we have the contrast with the way the world loves in verse 32 as opposed to the way we're supposed to love. But the first command here is that we are to love our enemies. And I know often in our culture today we think of love as being a feeling. Love is something we feel toward another person. Love is something we fall into. But the kind of love Jesus refers to here is not a feeling. It is a choice. It is a decision, sometimes in spite of our feelings, to do what is best for another person. We may think of the lawyer who wanted to know what he had to do to inherit eternal life. And 
And both he and Jesus agreed that he had to love his neighbor. They both said, you got to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, that's what we need to do. But then remember the man wanted to know, and who is my neighbor? And that's when Jesus went on to tell the parable of the Good Samaritan, the story about the man who demonstrated love, didn't just have a feeling towards somebody. He demonstrated love to somebody who was not like him. And so he made a decision. He, he might have even had to overcome his feelings to do what he needed to do here. And so this kind of love is a choice that we make as we decide to treat other people just as we would like to be treated. Not as we have been treated, not as they've treated us in the past, but we make a decision to treat them as we would like to be treated. And as if that's not challenging enough, Notice in this passage, the people we're told to love here, who are they? They are our enemies. So it's not just strangers, it's enemies. There's a history going on here. As I understand it, the word Jesus uses actually goes back to a word referring to hate in some form. So not that we are to love the people that we hate. That doesn't make sense, does it? Jesus would have told us just to stop hating. If, if you're hating people, knock it off. But that's not what he does. Instead, notice we are told to love those who hate us. These enemies are those who are enemies with us. We may not be enemies with them. These are people who don't like us. Uh, these are people who consider us to be their enemies, not the other way around. And so when we think about it that way, don't most of us have enemies? Don't most, don't most of us have people in our lives who hate us? Hopefully as God's people, we don't have people that we hate. But I think most of us have lived long enough to have people that we know who don't like us, who hate us. That's what Jesus is talking about here. As God's people, we are to love those who hate us. Maybe an angry neighbor. Maybe a neighbor has a beef with us for some reason. We, we didn't deserve that, but for whatever reason, uh, he or she doesn't like us. That's who we're talking about, a person like that. Maybe an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe an ex-spouse. Maybe a co-worker who can't stand us for some reason. We are to love those who consider us to be their enemies. And this is where we see the contrast in verse 32, where Jesus says, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. The world says, be nice to your friends. That's the world's way of looking at this. God says, love your enemies. God says, love the people who hate you. And so we don't just ignore our enemies. Certainly that's a temptation. If I know somebody doesn't like me, I might just be tempted, Just I'm just going to stay away. I'm going to avoid that situation. But here we find we are to look for ways to treat them in ways that we ourselves would like to be treated. And again, this is not a feeling that we are to have toward them. But in many cases, we might need to overcome our feelings in order to actually do what we need to do here, treating them with love and respect, uh, even when we might not feel like it. From time to time, I'll see... Uh, Christian people, people I know and love, uh, post something online, maybe a meme that says something to the effect, if you respect me, I will respect you. It's a two-way street. Have you seen that? I've seen that meme posted online. I've seen it posted by some people I'm pretty close to. And yet as we think about it, isn't that really one of the most unchristian, worldly attitudes we could ever imagine? If you want me to respect you, you better respect me. That's what Jesus is warning about here. According to Jesus in verse 32, that's the way sinners behave. Even sinners love those who love them. As God's people, we have to go beyond that. That's not good enough. We are to love those who don't like us. We are to love those who consider us to be their enemy. We are to treat uh, everybody not as we have been treated, not as they are treating us. But we are, treat them, we are to treat them just as we would like to be treated. Well, as we continue in verse 27, we find a similar thought. As Jesus says that we are to do good to those who hate you. And so it's not just a case of loving our enemies, but he gets very specific here. It's a case of actively doing good. In Galatians 6, 9, Paul tells us not to lose heart in doing good. I always find that interesting. Why does he have to tell us not to lose heart in doing good? Because it's possible to lose heart in doing good. Doing good is not always easy. It doesn't always feel good to do good things for other people. In Titus 2.7, Paul tells Titus to be an example of good deeds. 
In Titus 2.14, he tells Titus that we are to be zealous for good deeds. In Titus 3.8, he says that those who have believed in God will be careful to engage in good deeds. In Titus 3.14, Paul says our people must also learn to engage in good deeds, to meet pressing needs. In 1 Timothy 6.18, Paul tells Timothy, the young preacher, to instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. And so over and over again in Scripture, the Bible tells us to do good. And that's exactly what we see here. Paul got it from Jesus. Only here we are specifically told to do good to those who hate you. If I know somebody hates me, as I said previously, as with my enemies, I might try to just avoid that person. But here Jesus tells us to do good. So how do we know what to do? How do we know what kind of good we need to be doing? Well, again, as he says in verse 31, it comes back to this. We are to treat others the same way you want them to treat you. And so we are to think of somebody who hates us. We are to think of what we might want to have done for us. And then we are to do it. Maybe we give them some rare and hard to find cookies. I don't know. Maybe that'd be a good way to start. But whatever we do, whatever we might want to have done for us, we do that for them. It's not a matter of us just not hurting them, but we actively do good, Jesus says. And isn't that what Jesus has done for us? We think back to Romans 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then Romans 5 verse 10. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Jesus did what was good for us, even while we were his enemies. He didn't hate us. We hated him, in a sense, by the way we were behaving before we obeyed the gospel. And this brings us back to the contrast. Notice in verse 33 of our paragraph, If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. This is the world's standard. If you want me to treat you well, you better treat me well. That's the way the world does this thing. If we want this, we just need to join a bowling league. We'll get all that we need. Or some kind of social club. Maybe the the neighborhood bar. They'll give us that. Doing good to those who do good to us. We can get that anywhere. But Jesus calls us to a higher standard. Maybe we go grocery shopping for a neighbor who really grates on our nerves. Maybe we get out early, four in the morning, and remove the berm of snow from the driveway of the guy who's always making hateful comments in the Neighborhood Association meeting. You know, we we do good even to those who hate us, and this kind of doing good has a way of changing people. It's not guaranteed to change people, but you do enough good, sometimes people notice that. That kind of love is shocking. What in the world did he do that for me? Why? And they start looking into it. I've seen it happen. This kind of love points people to Jesus. We treat people as we would like to be treated. That's the golden rule. The next big action comes in verse 28 as Jesus tells us to bless those who curse you. The word that we have translated here as bless is basically a word we would recognize if we brought it straight from Greek into English. If we just transliterated it letter for letter, we would end up basically with the word eulogy. A eulogy. We know what a a eulogy is. Literally, it refers to a good word. A good word. A eulogy, of course, is what happens when we speak well of somebody at a funeral. You try not to speak badly about somebody at a funeral until you you find something you can say positive about the person. That's a eulogy. It's, It's speaking a good word. And that's what Jesus is telling us here. We are to speak good words to those who curse us. Somebody curses us, we respond with a good word, not another curse. We think of what Paul wrote in Romans 12, 14 when he said, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Where did Paul get that? right here. Or we might think of what Peter wrote in the context of marriage. Kind of interesting. We need to be thinking along these terms, blessing and cursing in a marriage. It happens, doesn't it? First Peter 3, 8 and 9, Peter, as a married man himself, said, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, 
not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing, a good word instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Do we as married couples need that advice from time to time not to return insult for insult or evil for evil? And so instead of returning insult for insult, we treat those who curse us not as they have treated us, but we treat them just as we ourselves would like to be treated. Instead of lashing out, we say something to build up. We say something to encourage. As Solomon says in Proverbs 12, 18, there is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. That's what we're shooting for. As God's people, we are the ones who are motivated to bring healing into relationships. Words matter. And this brings us to the last action word that we'll be looking at this morning as Jesus tells us to pray for those who mistreat you. Often when somebody mistreats us, when they treat us unfairly, when, when we're abused in some way, it's natural to almost be overwhelmed by that. We dwell on it. We think about it 24-7. We, we just, we think, we can't get it out of our minds. Jesus suggests here, though, that we pray for those who mistreat us. We might be wounded and hurt. People do some terrible things out there, don't they? People do some evil things, but instead of dwelling on what was done, Jesus here is suggesting that, that we take that focus, we take that attention, and we use it to pray for that person. We're already thinking about it. We're already thinking about that other person, so why not pray about it while we're thinking about it? Isn't that what Jesus did? Even as he was being nailed to the cross in Luke 23, 34, it's Luke who tells us that Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And I always find it amazing that he didn't just say this once. It doesn't say Jesus said, Father, forgive them. The tense of the verb suggests that Jesus was saying this over and over and over again as they were nailing him to the cross all through that process. He was continually saying, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing over and over and over again. Jesus then shows us what it means to treat others well. Not as we have been treated, but treating them just as we would like to be treated. As we pray, most of us pray for family and friends. I hope we do. We pray for the nation. We pray for the church. I hope you're praying for the preacher. I hope you're praying for the elders of the congregation. But if we're not doing so already, let's also be praying for those who mistreat us. Wouldn't that make our prayer lives even more interesting if we pray for those who mistreat us and abuse us, asking God to heal whatever it is in their lives that has caused them to do such terrible things, asking that God might be merciful as he has been merciful to us? And so these are the action words here. We are to love, we are to do good, we are to bless, we are to pray. There are a few more in this passage, but those are the ones we're focusing on. Before we move on, let's at least briefly look at two very practical principles and maybe examples, uh, case studies, maybe we might say. The first is found in verse 29. Practical principle number one, don't retaliate. And this is where Jesus says, whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And we could spend all day and all night and all of this week discussing this, but I, it seems that the general idea is when we are insulted, we as God's people, we can choose not to retaliate. Just a note here, a slap on the cheek is not life-threatening, at least to most people. I guess it could be to some, but this is not a life-threatening situation. This isn't a stabbing. This is a personal insult of some kind. This is the way they would describe a, a personal insult, a slap on the cheek. And we kind of understand that today even. But as Christians, when that happens, we don't respond how the world responds. We're different. We're called to a higher standard. We don't slap back. And again, we think of Jesus on the cross, described by Peter in 1 Peter 2.23. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Jesus then did not retaliate. 
And then as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, love is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love endures all things. And so just as a, a general principle, as a practical principle here, we choose not to retaliate. That's something we get out of the golden rule. The second principle comes in verses 29 and 30, and then also in verses 34 and 35, with the idea that people are more important than stuff. So practical principle number two, people over stuff. People are more important than our things. You know, generally speaking, we give, we lend, and we are just to expect nothing in return. If we make a mistake in this area, let's make a mistake in the direction of generosity. I would look at it like tipping. I hate numbers. I hate dealing with the, the whole thing. You know, figuring out, you know, your bill is $7.26. What is the tip on that? If we're faced with a choice there, let's make a mistake on the side of being more generous. Oops, I was too generous. Instead of looking back at it later and saying, oh no, that, that wasn't enough. Does that make sense? People are more important than things. People over stuff. Maybe one thing that we can get out of this application or the practical principle here. So it's better to give too much than too little. And again, like the previous one, we could spend all day discussing this. But the idea is people are more important than possessions. We know this. But sometimes we need the reminder, don't we? People are more important than cookies. Before we close, I would just also briefly note the reward in this passage. We can't leave this passage without considering the reward. And we do have some motivation here. If we live by the golden rule, Jesus, the Lord himself, says that our reward will be great. And we have the power to be like him because we're sons of the Most High. We ourselves have been shown mercy. And that allows us, that motivates us to show mercy to others. We think back to how God has treated us. And I think most of us are amazed by that. God has been merciful. And we think about that mercy that God has shown to us. We think about how God has treated us. And we treat others in the same way. That's motivational. We react with mercy in mind. And when the, when the world sees what we do, because of that, the world will see God in us. And that's what the Lord is getting at. We are sons of the Most High. We are merciful because He is merciful. We are following His example. As we close, I want to share a story that I read on Fox News earlier this week. Several days ago, Teo Jordan, 18 years old, was bagging groceries at a Kroger in Covington, Kentucky. I'll try to send this out as a link beforehand, but... An amazing story. This, this young man, 18 years old, was bagging groceries down in Covington, Kentucky. The high school junior on the basketball team just started working as a, a bagger a few weeks ago. And as a way of helping out his family, as a way of saving up for a car. And so he's got some goals. He's got some motivation. He's, he's getting it done. He got a job, got in there, jumped in there, making the money as a bagger. Well, earlier this week, the story said that an elderly man came through the line and didn't have enough money. And the cashier told the elderly man, you need to put some of these items back. And at that point, Teo stepped up as a bagger. He took out his own wallet and he covered that $35 that the man was short. And I kept reading the article and toward the end of the story, Teo said this, just treat people how you wanna be treated, you know? Always help out. If somebody needs it. Amen to that. That is exactly what we've been looking at this morning. I am so thankful for uh, the cookie crisis that led to today's lesson. This has been so tempting having these right here for the last uh, week or so. I just, uh, what an amazing temptation. I have overcome it up to this point. I'm thankful that one of our seniors has a well-trained and a sensitive conscience. I think that would be a very accurate statement, and I'm very thankful for that. This week, based on what we've studied this morning, I would encourage all of us, and I would challenge all of us, to try to think of some practical ways to treat others just as we would like to be treated. That might mean wearing a mask. It might mean not going out in public if we've got symptoms. It means looking out for ways to help, looking out for ways to do good. 
and we literally cannot list all of the possibilities. Again, as I said at the beginning, this statement right here, if this is all the Bible we had, it would be enough to keep us occupied and, and busy for a lifetime. How do I want to be treated? Once I figure that out, once I determine that in my own mind, I go out and I do that for others. We love, we do good, we bless, and we pray. As we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and merciful God. Thank you for challenging us today with your word. We look around us and the world may seem to be falling apart all over, but we know that your Son holds all things together by the word of his power. We studied his word this morning and we're thankful for the challenge. We're thankful for the reminder. We pray that we might take it seriously, that we would allow your word to take root in our hearts. This morning we ask for opportunities to do good. We pray that we might be merciful toward others just as you have been merciful toward us. We ask a special blessing on those we know and love who have tested positive for the virus. As you know, some have no symptoms at all, but others are suffering. We pray that our faith would be strong and that all of us would be able in some way to do good and to encourage. Thank you for making us a part of your family. We come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.